Let's Arthur, I think the last time the last time I saw you, you were a lizard man in Somnium space. Listen, many people <laughs> still don't believe I'm a real person. I'm not person. sure. Exactly. It might be AI. It might you be AI. You, you're not a, you could be a deep fake Arthur for all I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm deep, not sure about the fake, but no, yeah. I've, I've, seen, I've seen him sweat before. He's, de he's definitely real. <laughs> definitely real. All right. All right. I mean, uh, we're rolling. Thank you, Ronnie, for um, uh, accepting this invitation. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, we are definitely going to be discussing lots of things about um, XR, uh, but maybe I do, I start with a quick introduction of you and then maybe you can just pick it up and continue and say a few words about your career because it's vast and not all the information is out there on the internet. Obviously, I think a lot of viewers and a lot of uh, people who are watching uh, and who will be watching this interview will know you from Magic Leap, um, which you started at 2.11, is that correct? 2.11? That's a lot of, uh, it's a long time ago. Slowly Actually, um... I, I th informally, I was working on it in like 2009, 2010, like late at wow. night, but I think I formalized 2011, yeah. Okay, so that's a long time ago. That's definitely much sooner than I dreamed about XR, okay? It's much sooner than I started to kind of go into. So you're you're a real veteran. We're rookies here uh, for, for, from, from that perspective. Actually, it's um, 2009 and in, in 2009, I reached out to WADA in New Zealand and we started talking about it. Please cut bless. that. It's true. It's true. No, bless no, we can't. Again. It bless you and it's true. It means it's true. Okay. When, when, when that Thank happens, you. it's totally true. <laughs> okay. So, 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 no, I have, so I have a lot of animals in our house, so I have like allergies to some of them. We've got so All many right. animals, but no, in 2009, I reached out to Weta Workshop in New Zealand, um, which is uh, founded by uh, Richard Taylor, and they founded Weta Companies with Peter Jackson and all these amazing movies like mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings and Avatar. And <gasps> so I think the, that was one of the kind of early moments, but it didn't, I sort of, we started working together around then, but then I, uh, he became a founding board member, I think officially in 2011. Well, okay, that's that's a long time ago, and I mean, we all oh, many people know about magically, but what did actually bring you to? How did you end up talking, thinking about this concept? Because in two thousand nine, it definitely was not obvious. Okay, it was not even close to obvious. So, what what did kind of no. uh, spark this idea in your in your head? So th there were a few tracks. I'll, I'll I'll talk to you guys about the different tracks that converged. Um, I'm a bit of a weird left brain and right brain person. Um, mm -hmm. So <clears throat> with what I came to them with an idea uh, for a project that we're actually, uh, we've kind of like put more intensity into called the hour of blue, uh, which I, I now think of as a story world. And we started talking about like what happens beyond cinema. Like when, when you go past the 2d screen, not 3d movies, what is this? movement into like a complete world like what will that feel like uh and at the time i was calling it cinematic reality and i was like how do we experience cinematic reality so i was thinking about that and working with weta on a creative ip for that future that didn't exist yet um but it was thinking about that problem and what would you need to do to um, actually experience cinematic reality in a way where it's not like a box but you can really it could be everywhere uh yep. it could be all around in space and that's why i started to use the word spatial computing I, I thought we needed a spatial computing system to be able to have these kind of experiences uh, and it would be all around um and i had also had a really interesting experience at a siggraph so i was at a siggraph um, a couple years earlier um, I almost became an Imagineer at Disney and I ended up not doing that. I ended up <laughs> founding my first company, which was building robots. It's a long story, uh, but you know, Imagineering is Likewise. awesome. That's great. And I got to, I got to sit in a very gigantic Disney prototype, um, mm -hmm. of a big virtual reality system where you peer around. It was big and heavy. And I thought, okay, this is really cool, but it, what, what other ways are there to 
create those kind of visuals? And what if you wanted to blend the real world and digital together like Lord of the Rings did, where it's like you see the real world and then like there's digital creatures and it just very artfully blended. And I, I didn't think it was going to be those big, heavy systems. I didn't think in 2024 it would still be those big, heavy systems. <laughs> uh, so I thought we have to sort of tap into the brain. Uh, so I, I started to think about like, how do you tap into the brain and uh, how do you make cinematic reality happen? So it's those kind of questions that uh, got me going down the road. Okay. Very like okay. first principle kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so you founded it. And then of course, I think when it really popped up in, uh, and please correct me if I have some information wrong, because I also kind of mix uh, my own memory from what I remember. But then, of course, when when magically pop up in many people's kind of news feeds and minds was, I think, what two things: when you guys announced some kind of demos or trailer with a whale, very very famous one, and then of course when you guys raised a lot of money from prominent investors like Google, and so I think overall you raised over two billion dollars, right, uh, for Magic Leap at that time, if I'm not mistaken. So that that that's that's where kind of the boom happened, right? Uh, could you describe those moments maybe in the company? What was happening? How guys did you think about presenting the device? Um, what was your kind of strategy at that time? Um, how did with what kind of technological battles have you been battling? Because you know, I I, I build hardware myself. It's hard. Um, so what 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 are the roadblocks? What were the roadblocks for your for you guys there? Because uh, that pretty much it was intense. I, I assume. <laughs> Yeah, so um, a I'll, I'll sort of unpack a few things there. So we were operating quite quietly. Um, mm -hmm. We had like a little warehouse. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we hear oh, you yeah. perfectly. Beautiful. Beautifully. Perfect. We, we, had a, we had a little warehouse garage thing in like a strip mall in South Florida. Um, and I think it was next to like a laundromat. And like half a mile down the road was like a gun range. And you hear like gunshots. It was, it was just... <laughs> Pretty, pretty grungy uh, uh, place. You would never expect what we were building to be in there, uh, which kind of made it very funny and a little bit like uh, Men in Black <laughs> X-Files on some level. It was it was great, actually. Oh, uh, people would come into this like completely nondescript place, and then you'd walk in. It was like an insane lab full of wires and cool stuff. And um, But, you know, we worked there from like, I think like late 2011, through the end of 2014 before we moved and we got on the radar in October, 2014. So before then, nobody really know anything about us. I mean, there were like little tiny articles, you know, uh, cause I did Mako surgical. So maybe more in Florida, there were some like local articles, but in, in um, 2014 in October, uh, Google funded us. It was a $542 million round. Uh, okay. So we Could I, can from, I stop for a second, for a second, uh, what yeah. did you have at that time as a technical prototype? What did we were showing them um, uh, at that two thousand fourteen? Yeah. yeah, so this was um, this was a process that went from like spring of twenty fourteen through October twenty fourteen. So mm -hmm. we need to go back in time because you know it's like it's like ten years ago, right? Yeah, Almost yeah. ten years, a long time ago. Yeah. Um, and I think like. There's a lot of things that we now know about that nobody knew about then, right? Obviously. So around that time, I think it was maybe the spring of that year that Meta, oh, sorry, now now Meta, then Facebook bought Oculus for like yep. three something billion. Yep. Which was just like, whoa, right? It was just crazy. Wake up call. A lot of cash. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone's like, what is this? Um and we're running around, you know, having some discussion with investors, but not doing what they were doing. They were building um, virtual reality using like mobile phone kind of componentry. And we were talking about something else. We were calling it uh, spatial computing and mixed reality. I was trying to find the right names. I actually felt spatial computing was the right term. Uh, mixed reality got adopted by some bigger companies and they tried to co-opt it. And so we, we shifted over to spatial computing around then. Um, but hundred percent, uh, and and we're like, no, the real end game is where you have to use the brain as a display. And people are like, what are you talking about? And like, um, we're like, we have some prototypes. One prototype was the size of a room. It was like it took up a whole a whole back room office, and it was a gigantic machine. I called it the Beast. Uh, it's still a wonderful system that 
some of what it's doing and some of what it did is not touched by anything yet. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like a, just an amazing, an amazing thing that uh, conjured some magic. Could you unpack um, a little showed, bit? What is? Could you unpack a little bit of what? What exactly do you mean? Uh, what and is, will, will what? it fit in my shed if I if I want to steal it? Because that sounds amazing. <laughs> Laser beams into the eyes. Yes, please. Carry on. Sorry. Um, the, the, most, the most interesting thing about that device is because we were not limited by any size or form factor issues. Um, we were able to completely dial in on a few attributes. One of the attributes we wanted to dial in on was how do you create uh, what we were calling a digital light field signal? I think one of the most mi misunderstood mm -hmm. things about uh, Magic Leap. So, uh, yeah, we're on a podcast. So we can we can unpack this a little bit. If you go Absolutely. back, what is the light field signal? Um, a light field uh, has a physics definition, right? It de it defines the wavefronts of light, and the theory behind Magic Leap was you did not need to recreate the complete light field, and this was like something our co competition still didn't understand, and I think a lot of folks in the industry don't understand. Um, what we're saying is there's two things that intersect to create visualization. The universe creates a light field that obeys the laws of physics and has been since the beginning of the universe. It's just there. And that's not changing. So you might as well figure out what's going on there. The other thing is the human brain has been evolving for millions of years into that. So one's billions of years, one's millions of years. And my thought was, why fight that? Can we understand it? So we built a really interesting like research science team, neuroscientists, uh, some neurobiologists, I'm a bi biomedical engineer, physicists, we had a Caltech theoretical physics person, NASA engineers, really heady stuff, whiteboards all over the office trying to figure this thing out um, and go, how do these things work? And one assumption we were making that that we built this crazy machine to be true was, was about how the human brain takes in the light field signal and downsamples it. Mm-hmm. Um, I won't go into all the details because some of that's still proprietary and, and belongs to Magic Leap, but the high level thing I've talked about in public a bit. So this downsampling of the actual physics of a light field wavefront and how you do that properly, what is the ultimate downsampling algorithm? We were able to make that happen on what we call the beast. And we were able to show, wow, okay, this is probably what's going on. Because and then the guinea pigs were us, like because you can't shove electrodes into a human brain. You can do that with mice. We actually uh, worked with a guy who had the best name ever. His name was Dr. Meta, I think from UCLA. <laughs> Literally, Dr. Meta is his name. It was and he, Hello? he's famous for <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. And Dr. Meta um, actually put thousands of electrodes into the brain of of mice and rats, and he made tiny VR systems for them to see how those signals affected their brain. So we studied his research. We actually brought him down and we're like, we can't do that with people. So we were the guinea pigs. I'll do it. Uh, so we had to complete the circuit by shoving ourselves into this machine without the electrodes. Um, and what we were doing was varying, the machine allowed us to vary many parameters mm -hmm. of the signal we were generating from things that would be impossible to ever shrink down to things that you could begin to shrink down. And what was nice about that machine was we were able to understand, okay, this <clears throat> algorithm, this like signal chopping, when you get it to this level, it looks stunning. Like this is actually the end game. This is what it should look like. And when you basically, when you, when you get that right, you are using the brain and the visual cortex in the way it wants to be used, which is how it works every single day when, it, when you wake up. And you just create the world that you experience and it's beautiful. And like, like the rendering can't be beat because it's what we see in our brain out yep. of the real world. So we were like, can a digital signal, can a device one day make that happen? And that was our proof. And okay, at wait, some wait, wait, point wait, wait, we could have said, okay, go, go wait, on. Wait, wait, wait a second, because I love this. Because this is the already. most cool part of Magic Leap that most people don't <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah, I, I love this interview already because after each sentence, I have more questions than I get answers. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. This is okay. the least understood part about Magic Leap because and, it was and, one and, of the and, coolest and things we ever did. I want to understand because I actually believe that, that the brain is the ultimate end goal. Like we, we want display. to. Yeah, that's that's it. So can you, can you, can you explain to us in a nutshell, whatever you, of course, can share, what did, so when you say that you, you, you kind of hit the holy grail with that big beast, what you were actually seeing, like what you were experiencing there, what was that experience which you were kind of uh, uh, seeing at that point? So the, 
let me let me I, I have to move around the perimeter of what I'm allowed to talk about. Yeah, Listen, we won't tell what anyone. I can't talk about uh, because yeah. it, the company still exists, right? And there's we only have here. several hundred subscribers. Okay, nobody will. That line. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> so here, uh, Arto, I'll, I'll I'll try to string together things I talked about publicly. Mm -hmm. Right. So the interesting thing about the human brain, I'm sure you know some of this or a lot of this. Um, it has a hundred trillion connections, right? Which is which is amazing, right? You think about a 1.2 trillion parameter NVIDIA GPU. Well, those 100 trillion connections are not just connections. Uh, each neuron is probably some kind of analog quantum computer, right? There's there's different debates about what's going on. So you have this Whoa. massively connected um, yep. set of like, I think it's about nearly 100 billion um, neurons yep. that are probably quantum computers with all this like subtlety in between. And then the total connectivity is about 100 trillion, um, which is a very amazing network. But what's cooler about it for visual, it's about 40% of that power is visual. What's also interesting is how the brain can variable load. Um, based on what's happening, it could like reassign compute resources, which is really interesting. But a lot of it is visual because that's how we survived. And our theory on what was that algorithm was how do human beings survive? Like if you look at our, the length of our arm and how we needed to like work closely, like knitting or eating and then fighting lions or shooting bows and arrows, like all of these things actually were, were discussion points about how does the brain, what's the brain's compression algorithm? Because our theory was the actual light field physics signal continuously being absorbed by the brain is too much for the size of the brain. It's mm -hmm. just not, our brain would need to be much, much bigger. And it, and it isn't, even though it has all those connectivity, it's not big enough to handle that continuous input and store all of that. So mm -hmm. like, our view was it has a very elegant compression algorithm and we were looking into structures of the brain that were clues uh, and weird um, anomalies in the brain and visual patterns that were clues as to what that algorithm is. We were trying to reverse engineer a little bit about the, a little bit about the brain in order to find out this algorithm. So our view was the brain has a compression algorithm and it's hard coded in. All humans have approximately the same one. And we built a machine that was trying to spit out some digital version of that That's and insane. with enough fidelity that we could really confirm to the to the extent you can confirm hypothesis like i think we were right about it interesting so we were moving from holography mm -hmm. which is the tire capture of a wavefront to a like biologically uh, basically a biologically compressed digital light field signal and that's a very different thinking because what we're saying is holography is is dealing with physics only we were dealing with the union of the brain and physics and, and mm -hmm. believing that the brain did not need the whole signal, but it had a unique compression algorithm. And if we could uncode that compression algorithm, that would be the ultimate unraveling of how you do spatial computing. Mm -hmm. That would get you to actual real life resolution, uh, something I call neurologically true reality. If you can nail that algorithm, your digital world and your analog real world are indistinguishable. Because once you hit the brain's compression algorithm, it's the same thing. The reality creation of the brain is identical. So we were chasing what I call NTR, neurologically true reality. That was the beginning of Magic Leap. That sounds fucking and cool. It was really fucking cool, yeah. And we had an amazing Wait. investor who um, was one of the co-founders of Google, a guy named Scott, uh, who kind of lays low profile. And he was like super into this, like, just go make this happen. This is the moonshot. And on some can, can level, it, we could have just stayed a research lab focusing. Yeah, on that. it just sounds like, can, can it tell us if it's possible? Uh, what, so until the Google so kind of invested questions. that crazy amount of money, what, 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 so you said you had an investor, how much money until that beast or that point magically has raised so far? What, what was that so, number? So I was, I was angel funding in the very beginning. Uh, uh -huh. I, I make, make a surgical in public. Then we got acquired. So I was able to put a little bit in, uh, like a few million. Mm -hmm. um, but then I met Scott. Uh, we were going down traditional venture route. Mm -hmm. uh, long story short, Scott intervened and said, I'm going to be the guy that helps you guys do this. Mm -hmm. um, and he's very low profile. Like think about like what Paul Allen was to Microsoft. Uh, fundamentally important. And the, the, the legend around Scott is he introduced Larry to Sergey and vice versa. And he wrote the surgeon. And so around Google, they know who he is. And he's like a legend. He's just a brilliant coder and a, and a genius mm -hmm. architect. And he put in, I, I, I 
it's confidential, but he put in like in the order magnitude of like tens of millions of dollars. Let's okay. Say that okay. before Google quietly mm -hmm. with the idea that like, go build this cool thing, go make it mm -hmm. happen. Like, I want to see you guys make this happen. And he gave Great. us the space well done, Scott. to work. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. And Scott was amazing, right? He gave us the space to take on this crazy problem, right? Uh, well, like a you Medici need like benefactor. This. You need huh? people like this in the industry. Because without a Scott, people like that. Yeah. and he didn't have a venture mindset. It was like, make this happen. Make That's this awesome. whole thing happen. Scott, which is very I want rare, to meet right? you one day. Like a... <laughs> not to race, yeah, not to, just, just to meet you and, and shake your hands. Okay, I, I just I just want to make and sure. Look, Scott knew I, I built Mako Surgical. Um, we went public. He was very into robots and AI, and he was like, like a, kind of a fan of what we were building awesome. there. So he was like, we already kind of, I didn't quite know him, but he sort of knew about what, what mm -hmm. I did before. So when I said I'm going to tackle this problem, he was into it. But there's no doubt having a Scott who did not act like a venture person, but acted awesome. like someone who just wanted the breakthrough. And he gave us the space. He gave us the time to tackle yep. a problem without thinking like, what is it going to turn into? Just make it happen. Here's your wind for the sails. Yeah, it was like, uh, yeah. that was like the divine intervention moment. Like, and I think here's the interesting thing, like that first phase of the company pre Google, but with Scott it was a very utopian phase. We just had a small, brilliant team. Oh, man. Everyone knew we were on the edge of something super cool. And we were going in a totally different direction. Um, Love it. Then shove screens in front of your eyes. We all felt that was wrong. Mm -hmm. Unraveling the compression algorithm of the brain, that's the way. That was the final way up the mountain, and we're going there. It felt like we were unraveling a secret in the universe. And I'm with we you. Tell like, us it really more. was crazy. I, continue with the story because I'm like, <laughs> it's like reading secrets. a book now, right now, honestly. No, no it was secrets, like, but just the story is amazing. So, like, that became like this obsession. We were like a, like a Jedi monk kind of thing yeah, yeah. focused on this. And, and it was like one of those great moments in life where we're like, we feel like we're getting there, we're getting there. And I remember um, uh, one of our engineers, uh, her name was Jan. Uh, we were on the verge of making it work. And she went into the lab and kicked everyone out and, and locked the door and said, I am not leaving and you're not coming in until I crack it. It was like this legendary moment. Wow. And we all we were so we were like, well, what did Jan now do? There's two she people like, more I want to meet. Lab. She yeah. locked herself in the room and she's like, I'm going to make this work. This wow. final, we were almost there, but it was like, not working, breaking, not working. What the hell? You know, it was kind of like one of those things. You're almost there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like at midnight or one in the morning, she comes out. She's like, put your head in it. Grabs me. I put my head in. I'm like, oh, my God, we're there. And there was that last. Like? Yeah, can, can you tell thing. us what exactly oh! did you see there? Like, what, it, was, what, it was like, like whoa, it was I such a VR. I need to know. <laughs> it was a crazy moment. It was like, I'll describe the feeling of it. It felt like a revelation. Mm-hmm. It felt like we had, it's like, I, I, I play guitar, so I'm going to use a guitar. And it felt like when you tune the guitar and and you're trying and you to tune it, but you don't know how to tune. It's just noise. And, and all of a yeah. sudden, you hear the A chord, and then you hear the E chord, and you're like, what in the, it but the, the chord was our brain, and the signal in the brain were working together in a beautiful way that... Outside of that machine, I have not felt on any system ever oh since. Oh, my God. I would have cried so hard when I felt I was, you know, it was like Wait, a, do you want to tell us that this moment. exists somewhere right now in a warehouse? <laughs> it's, it's it's somewhere in the magic. It's like a Raiders of the Lost Ark thing. It's oh, somewhere in a magically back room. Um, okay. It got, it, it got disassembled, and we had plans to make a Beast 2 um, that got blown up by the pandemic. Okay. Wow. So but here, okay. here's the here's the other part, Arthur, and you're gonna uh -huh. love this. Um it felt it felt like we were entering sacred ground. It's gonna sound mm. weird, but when I wear I, VR, I, I feel mean. like I'm I feel like I'm watching, you know, I'm in a piece of technology. This was like, whoa, like we're in, we're in this other place where like this connection between human mind and universe just felt different. It just like the feeling of it the the quality of what was happening was was not a technology what, it was like a weird spiritual thing i like anyone was it, was it a mix of resolution and focal distance and how brain perceived yeah. that or what what was what i mean i know you cannot tell everything but like what what was the most striking part of it like was it that the correct perception of the 
of the you know of the focal distance or the field of view what, what what's that one thing which you you said okay re, okay that's it like that's that that that's the or like the vividness of colors or resolution i don't know there has to had to be i'll like give you i'll thing. give you a few things that mm -hmm. uh still pop in my mind so um <laughs> let me let me give you an example of like let's say a lion a lion at 100 yards looks very flat mm -hmm. and as it comes closer and closer and closer more and more detail appear until mm -hmm. the line is, let's say, within three feet of you, two feet. <laughs> and then you die. Well, but then the line itself has run away. presence and detail yep. and volume. And it, I, I called it inflation. Mm -hmm. The 2D cardboard line, you know, 100 yards away um, is all of a sudden more and more resolved. And now it's there. It's got a thereness that's completely real. Like it's a real line. Yep. So as we moved objects from far away to close, a couple things happened. They would inflate and detail that was not present in what in what we were sending was being built. That was freaking me out. So I'm like, how is that happening? Um, oh, and then we were like, oh, the reason that's happening is that we know how to do that. Like our right. signal was not oh. the most important thing. We were using the brain. The brain was filling in detail. The that's brain was incredible. filling in a lot of detail and the brain was inflating and the resolution increase was the brain. I was like, this is yeah. nuts. Can that I tell crazy. you one thing? Can like... I tell you one thing? One secret which yeah. I've never basically told anyone uh, publicly. Um, You're an Android. When I started Sono, <laughs> when I... <laughs> listen, listen, I cannot confirm nor deny anything in this in this direction. <laughs> but I, I, I just want to say one thing. When I started Sono, when I was when I first tried proper room scale VR and kind of you know I I realized how important that technology will be uh, was 216. When I started to kind of imagine somnium right in a, in a way how i want somnium to be and what this could be as a platform for me one of the first slides was a yeah I, I will find this slide i will send it to you Ronnie. you will you will see it was a pixelated tiger in a <laughs> bush and then fully fledged tiger in the bush but like with all 4k detail whatever you can imagine and i said in that slide i said the best computer is your brain and 100 percent right and 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 i said okay the goal is to trick the brain to believe that you are there right i didn't know obviously that what you guys have been working on the beast. in terms of the, i didn't know the beast the but beast. my gut feeling was telling me that while vr is something which is incredible and it can trick your brain 100 percent. it can trick your brain i'm there's another every level. day in vr there is somewhere another level we we are not that yet yet we're not there yet but there is another level i i will i kid you not i'll find you that's i have to dig you gotta send me that computer. slide because i will send you that slide i will send you that slide i think arthur would uh, what i realized the difference when we were playing with the beast and then we were seeing what vr is and other ar is um, one is trying to heavy lift human technology and force the brain into it. And the brain is neuroplastic and will kind of adapt. Yep. Mm -hmm. The other one was leave the brain as it is. It's an amazing device. It's an amazing computer. Gently ask it to do what it's there for. Like, why, did, why is the brain there? What does it do well every day when you wake up? Ask it to do that. And we had Fantastic. this crazy notion that there was a programming language for the brain. We hmm. thought that if there is a um, if there's a compression algorithm of the signal, there's also a programming language, and then the retina was a keyboard that you could actually so, program the brain through the retina. And so, if you understood that, and the brain is like a GPU that you can access, just so you can access like an yeah. NVIDIA A100 card. And I still 100% believe that. I yes, I agree with you, and I can tell you. No, oh, I cannot tell you. It's a secret, but. Um, <laughs> I will tell you privately, okay? Okay. Um, the I have an idea which 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 I already tried to work on. Um, I one hundred percent believe that we see this craze about Nvidia and stuff like that. I believe that with the right tackle of the brain, you can put Nvidia out of business because you will not need an Nvidia. You will not need that much of compute power to do things with the right approach with the brain. Because because once you do that, then basically your brain works for you, and you 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 you're you're you know there will be technology needed to kind of access or 
ignite those experiences, but it will not be on a level of, you know, having 25,000 GPUs trying to, you know, push the, the signal uh, into your brain or onto the screens. It will be something else. Now, what that something else is, it could be a Let's beast Let's not talk about that room. here. Much exactly. Better. Exactly. But but there is something else. And I totally believe it. And I, you know, I try to tackle this and I will continue to invest money into this. My my resources, I, it was very hard to find even the medical engineers for that, things like that. But I will continue trying to do that. Like Shona doesn't know he works with us, but he doesn't know what I mean, because like a small I'm amount clueless. of people know. No. And I totally believe that. Like I, you, you just, you know, you said something which... Arthur, I wish I could. I wish I could transport you in time there, because um, oh man, it was weird. Like we hit, we hit a peak of what I would say uh, a, an intersection between science and biology and physics. Fantastic! Uh, oh my, that God. was very That's interesting. So but then there was there was two roads. There's a crossroads. Mm -hmm. One was, do we just uh -oh. stay a kind of crazy research group mm -hmm. and continue down there and push and push and push and push? Or do we try to productize? And productize means shrink this giant thing down and bring as much of that as we could to the small level and also solve like 500 other problems. Like how do you shrink the computing? And yeah, the right, right. All and mobile the problems. UI yeah. and the UX and all of that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we thought that would take a few billion dollars, no doubt, uh, to do the shrinking and get it to the mm -hmm. consumer. Um, and you know, get to enterprise, consumer, all those different things. But here's what we didn't realize: um, that a few billion dollars is what our competition would spend every quarter, right? <laughs> like how crazy, you know, Meta spends Hello, three, Mark. four billion every ninety days, right? <laughs> this is the I did not see that coming, right? I don't think anyone understood the level of investment that this field is taking, and that Apple has probably easily spent tens of billions. But what's yeah. disappointing to me is they went down the other road. They went down the road, my view, of forcing um, really good technology at the brain. But wait, wait, wait. Can I can I then challenge you right here? Because you had the yeah. piece, right? You knew or you kind of felt and you knew on some level that what what's the right way, right? But then, and you had uh, Steve, was right? Steve who was uh, uh, financing you or what was, what was his name? Oh, no, Scott? No, no. Scott, sorry. You had Scott. Sorry, Scott. Uh, you had Scott who was financing you. And what was that pivotal moment where you guys decided to take it as a product, where you started to raise money from Google? You obviously, I guess, showed Google people the uh, the beast. I, I I would hope so. Uh, and 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 then what what happened? What what was that moment where you had to? Well, there, there was uh, the moment of like, okay, do we just say purely theoretical and then. You know, like you see some AI labs, right? That they just do research and they don't worry about anything. Wait, so you don't believe that you can ever solve beast into something which people can use? No, or you no, believe we did. We did, and I do. <laughs> no, I totally believe you can. Okay. Um, and what we said about was uh, I had a program mentality, my man. I'll describe the program to you guys. And the way I talked to our team about it was Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. So for those who aren't like rocket geeks, I'm a NASA geek. Um, Mercury was the beginning. It was like, let's go to orbit. Um, Gemini was the middle where let's orbit around the moon and do spacewalks and learn how to think about landing on the moon. And Apollo was land on the moon and walk on the moon for days and and come back. So our thought was, okay, we did the beast. We believe this is possible. We actually know the physics are possible. And we think the biology, what's going on, we think we have an algorithm and an understanding of how the brain is working on this topic. Um, we thought that was super cool. And we were chasing neurologically true reality. So we're like, okay, we're going to break this to Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. And I mapped out... Gen one, two, three, four, all the way to what I called ML infinity. Mm -hmm. We got through the first piece of Gemini, ML two. So we did, before we did the magic leap one, from the beast to the magic leap one, we did like, I don't know, a couple dozen in between prototypes. Like mm -hmm. Mercury was a bunch of launches of things. So the end of the Mercury phase was the magic leap one. It was like, okay, okay. we could prove moving compute down here. We were getting to understand weight. What does field of view ultimately need to be? How does computer vision work? Thermal. There's a bunch of things in Mercury that we needed to know were true. But that was and not even close to the beast, right? To the to the effect. Of it. it was just you know you wanted to shrink down the tech. You wanted to. We 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 tested one thing, a few things that were relevant, but probably one of the most important was 
uh, we had a multi-planar switching uh, lensing system in there that we could we could alternate between okay. uh, two focal depths when when I which was so not very focal lens near, kind of not anywhere near the not anywhere near the beast, but can you actually even do that part? So like think Mercury, like you got to work in stages. So the Magic Leap One was the end of Mercury phase. We learned a lot of stuff. Then we began what I call the Gemini phase. And the Magic Leap 2 was the beginning of that. And we were testing other things like compute, AI, sensing. And we had teams working on Gen 3, 4, and beyond. Okay. That was the most interesting thing. We're like, so we had a view that it could all come together in what mm -hmm. I called Apollo, that the goodness of the beast could also come in this. And that would require like an orchestra of many elements coming together. Like, of course, you know, teams of like 500, 600 people, each team, software, application, UI, computer vision, machine learning, uh, AI recognition, um, multiple kinds of optics teams, unique kind of like signal generating teams, neuroscience teams, uh, safety teams, quality teams, manufacturing teams. So just this whole orchestration began to feel like actually the number of engineers you'd have on a complex space program. And when we looked at the number of subsystems, it's actually around, this sounds nuts, but count the number of subsystems in a Saturn V and it's roughly equivalent to what we needed to do in the, in the magic. Oh, practice. absolutely. Yeah, sure. Of it's, course. it's a crazy number, except they're not very big. They're all super tiny. Yep. The complexity, Which makes it even more complex sometimes. <laughs> That's the I took the engineering point. team to Cape Canaveral because we're a Florida company. We actually saw the Saturn V, and then we realized we have a subsystem complexity level equal to that thing. So that was yep. kind of crazy, but it's just very tiny. Yep. Right. Much harder problem than a phone. Much harder. I mean, you understand this. Yep. Um, and achieving like the neurologically true reality part, I think, was the single hardest thing. Period. Uh, How the, the amount of new, unique, different components. And simultaneous engineering, process, manufacturing, and physics breakthroughs you need to have were amazing. But the coolest thing is we were building the best team on the planet. Um, and we were churning through those breakthroughs. Because when you are tackling such a hard problem, really brilliant people show up. That of was course, the amazing. Yeah, I, yeah. All kinds of people were coming from all over the world wanting to work with us. Um, and was really um, what really sucks now is that team is fragmented and dispersed. They're at Apple, they're at Meta, they're at Microsoft, mm -hmm. but they're not working together and they're not aimed at the right problems. They're aimed at sub problems or tangents. And so I think it's tough to know how many things you got to do at the same time in the right direction. So I this agree. field can meander around for another 10, 15 years yeah, but what happened? until it finds its way in the right direction. What happened? I mean, you, you had the investment from Google. So I guess you decided, okay, we take it as a product, right? So we have to raise money. So you guys said, Scott, man, let's talk to those guys. Let's show them the beast. And then they came and invested. But what happened in between? Because, you know, there, 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 there were problems. In, you know, I, I just want to kind of bring it up. Or at least that's what's known. There were problems. There was money raised. And then the expectations were not met. Or what, what was the, uh, what was the biggest problem you, in your opinion? I'll give you my perspective being in the cockpit, right? Which is yeah. oh, a different perspective from. Yeah. So first of all, like... Uh, it's very hard to remember what, what Google was in 2014. If you go back and look at the newspapers and read the articles from 2014, Larry was running the company and he just reunited with Sergey. So they had kind of come back as a team and Larry was talking openly about the moonshots of Google. Like it was a very optimistic yep. era. Obama was president. People were very p positive about the world. It was like a very... Um, amazing time in this country. I don't know what it was like everywhere else, but in the United States, there was a lot of optimism, a lot of moonshots, a lot of positivity, um, like Disney building Epcot kind of stuff. It was very yep. like, very, you know, people wanted to do amazing things. And Google was saying, we want to back moonshots. We're going to do big, bold things. We're the founders. We've got the company. We're going to do crazy stuff. And it was really cool. Fantastic. And they said, you're one of the things we want to bet on. We want you to do those crazy things. And we want to back that. So that was like hard to say no that's, to. That's especially that when you great. have, especially when you have the founders like talking to you directly, not the investment committees. You're mm -hmm. dealing with Larry and Sergey. Like that was very cool. And as founders at that moment in time, they had that like 
via we're going to terraform Mars, we're going to solve the climate, we're going to do all these crazy cool things. Mm -hmm. So if you go back in time and you're where we were talking with them and you have that founder energy from, you know, here's here's kids running a big company saying we want to bet on cool things that, you know, a hired gun CEO does not make those kind of decisions. You have to be a Larry or Sergey or a Mark yep. uh, to do that. So that was exciting. That was very exciting to do that. Um, but that sounds like they pursue. didn't put much pressure on you, right? In terms of the product, they said, okay, we want to back you, continue what you have been doing, but now you have much more money, right? Is that the right way to look at it? Here's capital. We're there for you if you need it. That okay. Was great. So that sounds building. amazing. So, so what happened over yeah, what the happened? next two or three years, those guys decided to stop running Google. So, so this, I'm just talking about like public information. Professional CEOs came. <laughs> so, you know, Sundar, who was on our yep. board, who's a very nice person, he came in to run Google. Yep. And they brought in a CFO named Ruth, who came in to clean house and kill off all the pet funny projects going on. So all the toys, they called them like all the cool things Larry and Sergey wanted to do. Uh, somebody came in, they put in a new CEO, they put in CFO and you know, these guys are like, let's give the keys to someone else to run. I, I can understand that when you're when you're young and you've got all that capital, you probably don't want to spend all your days like running a company. You're it's just a bit pity go though, but uh, it was a it pity because yeah. there was such a difference when you're dealing, and you know this, founder energy. The, oh, 100%. The, the founder has in the vision, especially when you have those resources, is totally different. Think about Jensen and NVIDIA. He is the founder and he can make bold moves. Fantastic. And he has. Yeah. It's amazing, yeah. right? Like Larry and Sergey running Google. But he had to stay there for what, 20 years? Or what was the, what is the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but when you, if Jensen left and brought in a professional CEO, you'd feel Out, something off, different happen. Off, yeah. So off. I felt when Larry and Sergey took a back seat, there was a change, right? A more, uh, obviously an operational cash flow sensitivity, great as a shareholder, right? But not yeah, so but great as a here. shareholder. Where's even the vision? Here. Where's the big yes. jumps anymore? So yeah. all of a sudden you lose that air. But here's what happened. Uh, we met, uh, this is pre-Trump, pre-Trump too, pre-Trump and pre-President Xi. So I'm just going to give you an interesting thing about how world events intersected with our, you know, understanding reality project, mm -hmm. which is how I thought of it. Before Trump, you have Obama. There's a very positive atmosphere. And this is a really hard thing to understand today in 24, but in 2014, 2015, US and China were holding hands together. The relationship was actually quite positive. Um, Jack Ma was coming to America talking about this new relationship and openness between China and the world, China and the West. It's so hard to think about those times now. Uh, so Alibaba, which is a company he founded, came to us. So as you have Larry and Sergey stepping back and losing the founder energy, we meet Jack Ma who loves what we're doing. He thinks it's the cool, and he has that founder energy and he's talking about like the East and West. Um, and we were going to have Google for the West and Alibaba for the East. Um, and they were on my board at the same time. And it was going to be this kind of hand. So Jack was like, on your board. He put Joe Sai, the co-founder. Okay, cool. So I have Sundar and Joe Sai on the and board you, of the But you, they didn't invest or did they invest at that time as they well? Did. Or Okay, they, they did. did. Okay. Mm -hmm. They made a huge investment. Okay. So 2015, we're feeling we've got Google, we've got Alibaba, yeah. we have everything you need to scale what we're doing, access to billions of customers. Yeah. We're in a really good place. In one year's time, President Trump is elected and President Xi takes power and begins to shut down the entire, the two of them get into a fist fight. And that's the end of the US-China friendship and the beginning of what's going on now. And we're right in the middle of that, right? I've cut, I've got the two iconic companies on my board. And these world politics absolutely affect what's going on. In fact, if you see what's happened to Alibaba, Jack Ma is not there anymore. And he, I don't know what happened to him. I mean, we won't go into that, but sort of like all, it takes. all of a sudden this, this like amazing founder energy growing China to the future, creating an open China, collaborating with the West has fundamentally shifted. We got as two Cold War guys bringing in Cold War air ideas. How, do, how did America, you, I mean, I understand, I understand that it affected you guys, but maybe in can a you very give big us way. like, 
to 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 can you give us like two quick examples which you can share how how practically did it affect you like let's say 216 to 17 like how what happened what, what did you have to divest them from like alibaba did you have to what exactly happened uh there so a very important marketing collaboration for us just shut down and there's a us thing called cifius council on foreign investment in the united states that basically said it just put china in the red zone so whatever no follow ups yeah amazing like like and our technology was deemed to be too important okay so we couldn't like there was nothing to do anymore like we couldn't really go in there anymore so uh, a whole piece of what we thought the world would be this harmony between the west and the east and having google on in the west and alibaba in the east and collaborating and scaling and bringing the power of their compute and their ai systems and their scale engineers uh, as well i mean they have amazing engineers just all of it like that kind yeah. of shut down over there so that okay. was quite interesting thank you trump thank you so i i don't think it's just even like i don't want to get into politics but it's it's the world changes right and there's there's there is there is but i've never felt like ways. i started a company before we went public we got acquired but i think what we were doing at magically was like too hitting a nerve and too central to computing mm -hmm. and we were almost too high in the sky meaning like like uh world politics were affecting us okay like it was impossible to unravel um our ability to do certain things um and, and But, here's the other piece the amount of capital you need to take on this game which we knew to a degree right we knew it was going to be a few billion dollars but our competitors were changing the game to be tens of billions that did not come public until google would not be able to catch up with like they didn't want to invest anymore into in this kind of scale right because new cfo new 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 board or whatever is that is that correct so uh, alibaba should could have I, brought I, the I money i can't talk about that part but okay. okay i can't talk about like i can't talk about that part because the company's still going but it's clear that mark and meta was going all in and we were speculating he was spending five or six billion a year and then what we what's yeah, now I mean, come to light is it's a quarter a quarter <laughs> right so you think about okay here's a startup company that is now challenging some very large companies uh, yeah. and the amount of capital to actually stay in that challenge to really play the game to go all the way into win full scale <laughs> is now requiring capital that only a handful of people have right it's we... giant companies it's sovereign funds and it's that's it Can no we theorize for a second? Can we theorize for a second? I just want to understand. Because obviously Mark, when he bought Oculus, um, he went ballistic into the spending. But on the other hand, um, he went into, you know, remember that crossroad you described. He went right, but he wanted to go left. Um, and if you could have enough money, let's say, like he had and he put it into, into Oculus, like if you would have access to that capital... Would you continue going to the beast road, like just to compete? Because he's obviously going to the route of, hey, we put the screens in front of your face, which is a let's say a common route for everyone for everyone to understand. That's how people see VR um, expanding. But you had another idea. Well, while Magic Leap One still was that kind of screen in front of your face, was a bit different take on it, but it's still something something in front of your face. But you wanted to go some some different. You you know want to go to Apollo, but you didn't have enough money to do that. Is that Am I reading this correctly or no, no, we, we did. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you the, what I can tell you what happened. So if you drew a line from the magic leap gen one to the gen two, and I cannot describe after that, but just imagine a three, four, five, and six, what that looks like up until the first quarter of 2020, when the pandemic crashed, we did have the support. So we were able to get the capital support to actually go the distance and chase Apollo. The fundamental thing that really changed for us, we learned a ton from the Gen 1. And the Gen 1 for us was Mercury. We, we used it to actually understand things about the yeah. world and users. That is no other way, and, and you know this, to understand without going there. And we were test bedding many things. And as we were doing that, it was feeding. Even before we even shipped the Gen 1, we were prototyping and testing with like hundreds and thousands of partners. We were getting feedback to feed the Gen 2, and the Gen 2 feedback was feeding 3 and beyond. 
there were multiple generations going on at once in the company and like different labs in the basement at different offices around the world. So we actually had line of sight to what happens. Like I knew we were going to get there. There was like zero doubt in my mind we were going to get there. How many the years thing did you that think really it take? disrupted it? The ultimate disruption was during the pandemic, two things happened. The world shut down and the economy crashed. An economy crashed from March until about September. And during that time, all kinds of things were going on. Like a lot of investors were completely freaking out. There was two things. Either investors freaked out and pulled everything or became opportunistic and predatory. So I guess the fortunate thing for the company is it's still there and it's still funded and it's still well-funded. So but, now it's Middle East, right? Now I would say Middle East. But, it's, but, it's, but the owners changed during that time. The, the, the ownership structure changed because during that time, some investors lost their nerve and others didn't. And the ones that didn't actually got the prize. Okay. And did, are you still a shareholder? I'm, oh, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a shareholder underneath some big shareholders, but I'm not involved anymore because I had a vision of where it was going and that was going to fundamentally change. Well, Can you tell okay. us, is any of that still being looked into? I know they have all the IP. The IP exists there. Okay. Um, but I, I think the, the beast, it, it was the magic. <laughs> I believe in the magic of teams. Like, The Beatles existed. Yes. And yeah. I would say for a certain number of years, we had just a brilliant, wonderful team of scientists, physicists, designers, creative people, artists, uh, people like Steven Spielberg would come by, uh, the guys at Weta. The mix was so amazing. It was not a mix you'd see anywhere in any company right now still. It was like a weird Disney Imagineering, Pixar, NASA <laughs> Just something that was like not normal at all. And when you came into the building, you felt this crazy creative energy. And that creative energy was pushing everyone to these limits. And, and everyone who worked there, the ones who were really in the cool stuff, it was like one of the best times of their life. And I think okay. it was hard to go to a normal company, do normal things after that. Okay, impossible. No, it's impossible. It's, it's almost impossible. Uh, it's because like after the Beatles, you can do wings or whatever, but it's not the same. Yeah. Okay. So maybe last question because we uh, never I mean... got to finish. Here's the part. That's, okay. That's, okay. Please. Here's the interesting, like, filmic part of it. And by the way, I'm writing a book. Um, I'm writing a few different books and working on two startups. But the interesting thing was we never got to finish. We got to the beginning of Gemini and we never got to finish. So it's an unfinished song. So the thing that is still in my mind is I know you can get there. And the frustrating thing when I see things like the Apple Vision Pro or Quest or what other people are doing, you're like, Knowing the way forward and seeing people spraying in the wrong direction is very frustrating, especially when you had that little bit of like, you know, that, that, that painting of, um, from Michelangelo where you have like the human and the divine finger touching. We had that moment for a second. And once you have that moment, you can't let it go. Um, and getting everyone back on that track so that that is what this computing future feels like. To me, that's that's the part I feel the most lost about working with that great team and I seeing everyone feel it. Like you're telling directions. it, and I'm always feeling. I'm, I'm not joking. I I, I, feel I, it. I, I know I know what you mean. I know those moments, rare moments when you when you touch something special. But if it take if it's taken away from you, that's re that really hurts. That's that that's you know um, you know what I think, Arthur. I feel like we were getting. It's gonna sound a little bit metaphysical. I feel we were getting too close, and the universe corrected. It's like no, you you can only <laughs> look at exactly it for a what second. You You're not allowed this secret sauce. No, take it away. Yeah, well, you know the, the the best scene in a movie that ex that uh, that explains it. I don't know if you saw Maverick, Top Gun, where he's going yes. to Mach 10 and he gets to that Mach 10 for a second, and then the plane explodes. Yes, yes. Like that's yes. what I felt like. That is exactly what it felt like. We, oh my God, we're there, Mach 10, and everything just whoa, what happened? And then suddenly you're like covered in smoke, and you're like, what happened? And I. I really felt like the universe was like, you can touch this for a second, but back off, buddy. Like you're not going past that line. Wow. It, it wow. Had, and everyone else is like, okay, let's go to normal. Let's fly 50,000 feet Mach 2. But we were trying to go Mach 10. We were trying to go all the way there. And we saw it. We saw that moment. You're like, oh my God, there it is. <laughs> okay. It like wait, wait, wait a second. Okay. So I have to ask you about this guy. Okay. Because now I got one. You, 
now that you told us the the story, I've you know I told you I love it. Um, from 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 you know various reasons, I have very long review of it, like for one one and a half hours. But what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts about this? What do you think? Let me let me separate out. Um, hang on, let me do this really quick. I'm going to tell my next call. I need another 15 minutes so we can go a little bit more. Please, thank oh, you. Hang on a second. Lovely. Um, need until. Tell them we love you. We love them and you too. <clears throat> okay, so here's here's the here's the two things. Because of what I just described to you, that Mach 10 moment, and having tasted it for a second. Um, knowing what Apple can do, the resources they have, the yeah. amazing engineers, the scale, yeah, um, which is 50 times what we had. If we could touch that, I know they can get to They Apollo. could have grabbed it, yeah. yeah. And not building Apollo is very frustrating to me. Like knowing they have the money and scale and engineers, but they're not aiming at it. Now, maybe you they will. Maybe, maybe they, they are. Maybe that's what they want to bring to just until they kind of can completely bring the other thing. Do you think it's possible that they are doing something like that while they're just, you know, that this is kind of a dead end device, but it will be there for seven, 10 years and then they will just switch to something different? So Could let's unravel be? the different parts, right? Yeah. Um, I think the UI, UX and application integration experiments, like the software part, Clearly, something they'll continue to be able to port across whatever the yeah. hardware is. Yeah. So that part works. And Apple foundation ecosystem. is amazing. Yes. Yeah, and it's going to be better than Meta. Their ecosystem is strong. Like your phone talks to this, talks to that. Like yeah, yeah. Photos, yeah. all of that is good, right? Yeah. That part's really good. The crossing the line to 4K and experiencing like 4K resolution and knowing that okay, if we're between four and 6K, but we don't have to deliver it the way they're delivering it. But knowing that that makes things really wonderful. It was also good to experience. Now the weight is horrible. Uh, there's all kinds of like, you know, to put so much weight on the front when you could do different load distribution. And the part I think is inexcusable um, is if you're gonna have the belt pack, which which is what we did, we moved the weight off the head onto a compute pack through a cable. Yep. So they have the cable, they have the battery pack, but they left the weight. To me, that's that's the inexcusable. I you think it's coming. Move the weight. I think it's coming. I think they will do it. It's just they wanted of us to get used will. to something. Yeah, they will. A hundred percent. But I, I felt I like no as a Gen One, if this was twenty twelve and they ship that, it'd be fine. But there's been so many examples of what you need to do in design choices. This one felt like a weird one. Like leave the weight and have the belt pack was like, if you're gonna have a cable and the weight already on your pocket. Don't also have the weight on your head. The only benefit of the cable is to move all the weight off. So leaving the weight in the cable to me was like one of those really weird design decisions. And you and I are, are taller people, right? I'm 6'2". I played football. So, so much. If you're a five foot three woman or small guy with a small cervical spine, this is not good, right? Like, the, the, no, we no know this is not made limits. for. Yeah, I, of course, of course. No, like, I, mean, I, I said weight is it. not a problem for me because all the VR enthusiasts said, "Oh, it's too heavy," and I said, "Heck, you guys use Valve indexes and stuff. Like, you, you cannot mean it, and like, you cannot just go from Valve index, take the Apple Vision Pro, and say, oh, that's too heavy.' But they, they are saying it because they say it's too heavy for it to go fully mainstream. But I don't think this device meant to go fully mainstream right now. I, I, I didn't no. think that Apple wanted it to go mainstream yet. The, it will the, be the, the part the that here, here's the part that like if you have that the amount of capital they had and the amount of years they've had to work on it, it I thought it should have been closer to that goal. That that was that was my only. I'm criticism. afraid some laws of physics still apply to them as well. I I Maybe. recognize it from this device because I'm building my headset and I look at. I know you've been tackling did. the problem. Exactly, and and I kind of you know my first reaction. I, I kid you not, my first reaction when I took this first of all beautiful. Uh, industrial design. I think they did a great job. But when I took this on and I it turned on, I said it was a bit of revelation because I said, "Oh, they're still battling and having the same physical problems as we do." Right. They're it's human. still yeah, they're still humans. You know, they yeah, it's still there. It's beautiful, but the problems are still there. Uh, so I was like, "Good, we're in the right direction." At least for our from our perspective, you know, with the optics and with with other parts, we are kind of in the, with the pastor. We're kind of in the right direction, but. Yeah, I mean, look, I I love the device because it's 
the ecosystem, it's the use case, it's the those things which are you know one thousand smaller things which matter. And I kind of look beyond this device. I look beyond what Vision Pro is today. I know they will fix all those problems. I know Apple. You know, first Apple Watch were pretty horrible. Um, today they are the best selling watch on the planet, and they are pretty good. Yeah, they are pl- pretty good. Six seven so, generations later. Exactly. So Arch, I'll tell you the parts I like the best, and tell me if you if this agrees with you. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're in full VR mode, mm-hmm. the graphics are amazing. The brilliant of co- brilliance of colors. I like their full VR mode. Yep. Um, I love being on the moon and throwing up a movie because like, watching Super Bad on the moon is very cool. And I realize this is a virtual reality device at the resolution you want, which was nice. The other thing I really liked was. Um, I gave a talk on this at South by Southwest. John Favreau, he gives you a sliver with the dinosaur encounter. Like when the, mm-hmm. you know, like he has the, he produced it. But what's really interesting about it is the, they're aware of you. They come into your room. It's mostly VR. But the idea that we can go into spatial cinema, not 2D movies, not 3D movies like Avatar, but ultimately cinema that you fully experience. Um, I, I, I call that movement, I think of it as story worlds. Like when we, you'll have a cinematic reality experience, like you're actually in a story world that doesn't need to be a game. Um, it's just like beyond a movie where you're actually in the thing in a full world that's yep. realized at retina resolution that feels neurologically correct. I think that's an exciting time. And the Vision Pro looks like it's pointing in that direction in full VR mode. Like that part. I thought was exciting. And you ultimately know because of their size and amount of money, they will keep pushing to get there. That part I thought was good. I think it's amazing. I think the mix of while the pass through is good, it's the best what is on the market, but it's still, you know, sometimes it's grainy and there's some color shifting and stuff. I think this mix, like when the dinosaur goes out of that screen and you see that it has partly in the room, it's amazing. That's very powerful and magical. Like when the tail goes and you can see the tail is kind of in your room and then it goes in. Perfect. Um, what got me really um, is, again, software and integration. Amazing. Like the windows, the shadows they cast on the real world. Great. Uh, they really nailed it because they, they give you the sense of presence. The audio, the spatial audio, right? If you talk to someone and then you put them further away, it reflects from the walls because the, the 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 headset is aware of this. Like they really nailed a lot of things like that. They're, these are small things. It, they're really complicated, but they're small things which people don't realize in the beginning. What really got me, honestly, is one of the demos when you go into Apple TV Plus and you do this immersive videos demo where they go through experiences and you see football match, right? Or soccer. You see, you know, you see animals, you see train, you see all... I rarely, you know, I've spent every day in VR. I'm in every day in VR. Um, I've seen tons of stuff, you as it's well an and stuff. It rarely something gets me that emotional. Like that demo got me emotional because I realized, first of all, what the future of entertainment is. Um, it's incredible. Whether it's cinematic like uh, dinosaurs or it's um, immersive videos like that demo, it's going to be incredible. And knowing that Apple will go through with this vision. They're not doing it for one generation. They know mm-hmm. they will push it for five generations, no matter what people say. You know, it's it's gonna be here and it's gonna be you know it's become it'll become better. So that's Arthur, what here's made a, me excited. Let me share a frustration because I agree with you completely, but I'll share with you something we had built to demonstrate the Gen 2, which mm-hmm. I think the current team forgot all about, but I thought was super amazing. Um we, we were building like a passable shareable world. We called it a magic verse. And we had our campus had a 300,000 square foot manufacturing facility, two floors. We meshed the whole building. Mm-hmm. So think about having 300,000 square feet fully meshed. Yeah. And everywhere you go, the system knows where you are. So now you have this, think of that as a gigantic real world game board. One of the crazy things was running around with like prototypes of a Gen 2 watching Fortnite characters run down the hallway at full size, <laughs> turn a corner, go under a chair, and you're like, oh, there you are. Like, not just seeing the dinosaur in front of you for five minutes, but a persistent series of characters running around a gotcha. giant building. Like, that was 2018, 2019. It's 2024. So when Apple shows the dinosaur, I'm like, 
we already know what's possible. I thought they have Apple Maps. Um, why can't they, they, hundreds of people they, be walking around New York seeing I exp like, I explain why. running I explain around why. Do you know why? Do you know why? And I think that's why they're, many they're, 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 they're walking people slowly. In yes. There. You because that's why many companies failed. Uh, and I think maybe that's partly why Magic Leap hadn't you know, get the full success. I don't know, but I'm just we saying were living like, like 10 years ahead of everybody. Yes. That you can people honestly like go on the street and ask them what, you know, what, what's the, what's VR, you know, people have no idea. People they, they have change, they? They literally have no idea. Change. So Apple needs to, you know, what Apple did great is onboarding, uh, sale process in Apple stores, right? All those things had to click together. So Apple had to have stores. They had to have those representatives. They had to have this process of scanning of the face. Like there's a lot of things which need to connect so that they can take your hand and slowly, but very steadily move you through all these problems, you know, of XR because you've demoed XR as many times as I am probably, maybe even more. And you know how people rake things. You just put it on their face and like, oh, well, what do I do? I don't know. I'm sure I'm busy. You know, different things. And that needs to be solved. And I think one of the biggest things for this device is not to sell you millions of pieces. They want to it's solve to move those. them slowly. Exactly. Yeah. Just put you a little bit further and say, go, try it. Okay, do the first step. Because of course, I, I I mean, I cannot imagine they do not do those experiments. They have to have those experiments in their lab. They absolutely have to. And they know what's possible. And I'm sure they're working on it. I hope you do, Apple. But the, that's that's the whole point. They have to walk you through. People are not ready for this. They're, they're just, me and you and Shora, yeah, we're all ready. We just give us, connect the brain, we're, we're there. So are, are, so you know the idea of the unevenly distributed future, right? I think yes, of course, of course. Some of course. people that we're living in 2035 right now in this field, right? Yep. And wanting it. And others yep. are living in 2008. Yes. Like before yes. And I think what Apple is doing and probably the thing they have stronger than almost any other company yeah. is their it's brand. Like... Yeah, they're using their brand power to pull people slowly. Yes. yes. But I think people like you and me are impatient Oh yeah, yeah. We're, we're running. We're like, hey, come on, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Come on, let's go. Exactly. Faster, faster. I, I agree with you 100. percent I, I, you know, the wish list for this device for the Gen 2 for me, it's like this. <laughs> we're like small, small. Like it, it's huge. Uh, but the reality is, I need to trust. Uh, first of all, I'm trying to build some of my device. I want to put some of the vision in my device. But you know, I'm not even close to what Apple can do. So I'm putting a lot of uh, parts in here because, for example, when I look at Meta. Given how much money they spend on the devices, the resulting devices they're putting out to public is, to me, like, meh, you know, like it's it could have been that. much better. They yeah, could yeah. have done so much more with that amount of money, but it's not still yet there. Like they, it, I don't know what's happening there, but no, are, are there your somnium space worlds, right? The worlds you want, the, you can imagine that in gen two and gen three of this. Yeah almost all the things you're imagining begin to happen, like the quality, the fidelity, the graphics yeah. horsepower, the cloud interactions, that you're on a path that you know you could build something yep. that eventually will get to mass market. Oh, absolutely. That's why we're doing it, of course. It's, it's, I'm just, look, I mean, Oculus has been doing it for a long time, right? And they have spent enormous amount of money, probably more than Apple, honestly, probably more you, than you Apple. You know, the estimate, um, Matthew Ball estimated maybe about, nine months ago that they had spent 59 billion yeah yeah, yeah. i mean <laughs> exactly. my bet is they probably spent 80 billion today let's say it's 40 US. okay 40 billion no, no, it's way more than 40 exactly it's so somewhere what, between 60 and 80. it's 60 and 80 and then you put me billion out a, US a, a, yes and you <laughs> put out the, the best you can do the best you can do is quest pro and quest 3. give me a break like what i are you smoking something or something in, in oculus like where is the the money where is the research? Because one way, one thing is to do research. Great, I, I, I assume they have some good stuff there. But where you have to put the devices which relate to people. Otherwise, if you mess up your uh, your store, if you mess up your uh, onboarding process, if you mess up the the privacy and all the linkage to the phones and stuff like that, nobody will use it. And that's where Apple comes in and says, no, 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 we will take your hand and we'll gently move you further, step by step without all these compromises. We'll just try to give you, you know, glimpse of the future every step of the way. That's how I, I see it. And that's why Mark is so nervous. He is nervous. He is. Arthur, here's the best thing about Apple. I'm going to put on two hats here. Um, let's say you want to be a film director, a Lucas, a Spielberg, something like that. 
but no no projectors or movie theaters exist. Apple is going to make the scaling movie projector and theater. It's going to actually show the way ultimately where a lot of people get it. Now, if you want to make for these things, you will now have mass audience. So I feel if you're a creator for games, for new kinds yeah. of movies, new experiences, you've been prototyping and, and playing for smaller audiences over the last 10 years. Now, I think what they're saying now is you build on this, it'll be portable across many things, but the future generations of this will be amazing. That's what they're saying. This is the future of entertainment. I told it in my review. This is how there's no, I you, did you try the 3D movies in this? I guess you did, right? Yeah, I yeah, mean, no, I th there's no question that this is the best way to watch 3D movies. No, I, I mean, we have IMAX in Prague, like no IMAX can even come close to this. It's just, it's just natively the done there. movies with... will disappear, right? I think, uh, Arthur, what I think is going to happen is 3D. In movies some point, yes, into, they'll turn into spatial cinema. Spatial cinema yes. is not 3D movies. Spatial movies. It's full everywhere, like spatial absolutely, computing, spatial absolutely. Stories. The spatial storytelling, like sleep no more, uh, things that are all around you persistently will feel incredible. And a new crop of directors will come who understand oh, yes. that. That's again, kind of, that's that's very exciting. But again, every iPhone can now shoot the spatial video. That's again the Apple part. That's what they're doing. The they, all new TikToks, you know, if TikTok it, it, on Instagram or other social networks will not adapt to that. They will fail and there will be new ones which will adapt and will be created because people will want to share spatially. They will want to consume spatially. You know, I don't want to watch the review of the device if it's not in a spatial video anymore. I want to see the depths. I want to see, you know, that's the whole point. That's the new content creation and the new movies. I totally agree with you. Tell me if you agree with this, that this is going to happen. And at some point, whether it's Apple or someone else, all of that will intersect with that little moment we had with the beast. And think about the technology that enables the brain to feel real reality, like real neurologically true, not 4K screen, but the level beyond that where your brain is interacting with what it believes the world really is, right? It does not believe the world is a screen. It does not believe the world is a stereoscopic display. It believes the world is a, and it is a light field wavefront and it interacts yes. with this. Once you actually unlock that with everything else we talked about, we are we are shifting into a different era of humanity. Like right now, we're in the transition. Phase. One hundred percent agree. One hundred percent agree. Now add AI I, into that, and I know you think about this. Like that yes. with AI together is just a very astoundingly different experience of the world and reality. And here's the question. Are. Here's the question to you. Maybe because I don't want to keep you longer, but here's the question to last question of this evening. Do you believe that somewhere deep in the lab of Apple and Meta? or Meta, uh, do you believe that they have this beast moment already? It's a very hard question. It's not an easy question to answer, to be honest, because I am not sure. I am not sure. Uh, I I think, I think yes, and I'll tell you why. Um, I know, I know these guys, right? Uh, Tim is not, he's a very smart guy. Mark is a very smart guy and they're spending so much money and uh, they've got tens of thousands of people working at this. Um, and just like we were, there's going to be like labs that are shut from the world. No reporter, no nothing, where they are pushing way past what you see today. Um, and I also know this because hundreds of the people that work with us are in these companies right now. So the weird thing about Magic Leap, it's like the pollen. It's pollinated Microsoft and Meta and Apple and a bunch of companies. But enough people that worked around what we were doing who saw where it could go are now at these companies. So it's very hard for me to believe that somehow that pollen didn't infect some of the thinking over there. So I think now on one level, uh, forget about the IP, that's the current owner's problem. But from a user perspective and from a field, this might be ultimately a good thing. Right, the field might actually now all be progressing towards like a really interesting north star, the beast. Well, hopefully, you hopefully got the, the, the transcendent. Well, hopefully, slightly smaller, but still <laughs> the beast. Well, no, much much smaller. Like, and the interesting of thing course. is, like the componentry to do it when it's all said and done. Um, first of all, I don't know if the U.S. or Europe have the kind of capabilities to do. It. I think it's Korea, Japan, China, Taiwan. Um, oh, 100%, I agree. Really get down to like kind of this like 
um, call it like very tiny components that can modulate things. I'll leave it at that, that are solid state. Uh, and you can make it, right? And you're going to get down to this, like the same level of like two, three nanometer etching that you do in an NVIDIA GPU. You're going to do that with photons. You're going to etch tiny little structures in, in very interesting kind of componentry. Um, and by the way, it might be really weird material, synthetic diamonds yep. or all kinds of stuff that you got to get to. But my guess is they will get there. Uh, we understood what you need to do to get there. And companies with much more money have the resources to get there. Timeline? How many years do you think? Let's say oh. Apple. How many years Apple needs to do that? Arthur, if we did not have the pandemic mm -hmm. and and we were not interrupted, I would say like 2026, we would have been there. Uninterrupted. The team we had. So interrupted, diffused, people all over the place, different orders. You know, I think maybe early 2030s. If what you and I just talked about is happening, if if those teams are really working behind the scenes. That's and they're very soon, the actually. That's very probably, soon. I think early 2030s, I thought 2026 was possible with a concerted focused effort with the team we had moving in mm -hmm. a straight line. So teams moving in curvy lines, but with tons of money. Uh, if they don't get there by the early 2030s, it means what you and I hypothesize is not happening. Okay. That they're not doing this in the back room and they're just like really spraying money in a bunch of crazy directions. Here you go, ladies and gentlemen. I think that's, first of all, that was fantastic. Uh, it's a lot of fun guys um, some excitement was, over the horizon thank you for coming and i it's it's a it's a it's 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 really like a fresh air you know i i i really feel kind of you know because sometimes those things which i thought i thought like i'm alone i'm crazy you know um now i know you're, i'm not, not alone, alone i'm not crazy you're, exactly i'm not alone you're both crazy thank, but you're not alone <laughs> thank god thank god for that and uh that that definitely helps and Thank you for coming. I, mean, I had so many other topics I wanted to discuss about current um, XR market, but that leaves us an opportunity next for time. the part two, exactly, for the next Let's time. Let's do part two. Arthur, and, we uh, should also do a Hangout in the Vision Pro. Uh, let's do that one day. Oh, absolutely. I'll, uh, yeah, we can have a FaceTime uh, soon and we can we can, we can can discuss those things in a private setting. I'd be happy to setting. do a part two. Uh, first of all, this was really fun. And the other part is you guys are in that zone. You guys are real, uh, more than enthusiasts. Like you are full drinking and swimming in the ocean water of what this is you know who I we are you know who we are and that this is the i think it's a blessing we are an independent company who is basically you know nobody's telling me what to do and i'm i got the opportunity to realize my vision though i don't have resources like you know magic leap had on facebook while you know on our level we still have enough resources to continue pushing our own hardware and do it Keep independently pushing. And I will keep pushing because that's that's the goal. What I have in 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 my life, I you know I this is what I want to show also my kids. Listen, this is what we're going for. You know, if, I I would hate myself if I would not try. Like I would hate myself if I would not try. That's it. You that's, know what, to me, Arthur? You problem. guys might you might unlock some things that no one else is thinking because size of team is doesn't is matter. Not the most important thing. It's like you have the. The right set of brains. If you got the right 10, 15 brains, we're trying. That it, all that yeah. matters. Yeah, we have an amazing team, but we're trying, of course, to get more people into the ASIC and stuff. But thank you for coming, Ronnie. It was awesome. amazing. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you. And we'll hang out in, uh, in Vision Pro. I'll show you the secret uh, presentation uh, okay. and all the other stuff. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that deeply. And uh, for all people who are still watching, thank you for being with us. And until the next time, bye-bye. Thank you guys. Bye. Had a great meeting. Bye guys.